Welcome everyone to part two of today's uh, webinar series, Training Without Travel uh, for Internal Audit Webinars. Uh, this afternoon's topic is Auditor Independence, Challenges and Opportunities. My name is Jim Kaplan. I'm founder and owner of AuditNet, and I'll be moderating the webinar. Joining us is Michael Brizetti, president of Boundless LLC. I'll let Michael go ahead and make his introduction right now, and then he'll turn it back to me, and I will cover the housekeeping rules, and then we'll get right into today's topic. Mike? Thanks, Jim. And again, welcome everyone to uh, our second webinar for today on the topics of independence uh, and objectivity. Uh, you see my background there. Hopefully you've been uh, with us in some of our previous uh, webinars, so I won't get into too much uh, detail here about my background. But I uh, did want to say that I'm looking forward to talking about um, you know, some of the, the, the fundamental important aspects of independence and objectivity and really how it affects internal audit. Um, and I think these terms are sometimes uh, not as glitzy and glamorous as, uh, as some other ones, but they really truly are fundamental and foundational in what we do. So looking forward to talking about that with everyone today. So Jim, back to you. Thanks, Mike. As I mentioned before, my name is Jim Kaplan. I'm founder and, and owner of AuditNet. Uh, the global resource for auditors. Uh, the next, uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to cover the housekeeping items for today and uh, then we'll get right into today's topic. Uh, this webinar and its material, the property of AuditNet and its webinar partners, specifically uh, Boundless LLC. So unauthorized usage or recording of this webinar or any of its material is strictly forbidden. We are recording the webinar and you will be provided access to the webinar within two, uh, within five business days after the webinar is done. Uh, we also kindly request that everyone fill out the brief online evaluation questions that you'll see at the conclusion of the webinar. Your feedback is very valuable, so please take a minute or two to complete the survey. In addition, because the webinar qualifies for CPE credits, we will be putting up polling questions in compliance with NASPA rules. Those answering the questions will receive their CPE certificate by email within seven to ten business days. It's an important reminder that you must answer all of the questions in order to receive the CPE. This is a requirement of, uh, of NASBA, so we do require that you answer all the questions. If you're accessing today's webinar from a tablet or a, uh, an iPad, uh, you will have to uh, send us the answers to your questions separately as you will be unable to answer them over a tablet device. You will have an opportunity both during and at the end of the webinar to ask questions. Submit your questions during the presentation via the chat window at the lower right hand box on your screen. Type your question and press it, return to send it. Any question we're unable to answer by the end of the webinar will be answered via email within 48 hours. As the moderator, I will be launching a poll, showing the results, and monitoring any questions. In addition, if GoToWebinar stops working, you may need to close and restart. You can always dial in and listen and follow along with a handout that was sent to you earlier today. At this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mike to get into today's topic of auditor independence, challenges, and opportunities. Mike? Thanks, Jim. And again, welcome, everyone to today's webinar. Um, uh, wanted to start off by covering some of the learning objectives here. Uh, first and, and foremost is because independence and objectivity are often terms that um, I, I think we use interchangeably, but wanted to set the stage and uh, talk about the difference and the distinction between the two, uh, particularly from a internal audit and, um, <clears throat> and um, Institute of Internal Auditors perspective. Um, it, next, we're going to understand how the international standards and guidance apply to the organization, the chief audit executive, and the individual internal auditor. Um, it, it's important, to, I think, understand, and we'll talk about this when we get into the, the really the, the details of independence and objectivity. Uh, once we understand what they mean, is who does it really apply to, and does it apply to individual people, or does it apply to the internal audit? Uh, department, um, uh, the activity in and of itself. Um, and then we're going to talk about some real world inspired discussions uh, and scenarios and talk about um, threats and, and how independence and objectivity could potentially be threatened and how we really want to promote independence and objectivity uh, within our organizations. Um, I've started off by saying, you know, the, the terms independence and objectivity, they're, they're not very glamorous words. and 
we don't often, I think, or often enough, I should say, really evaluate and assess um, the independence and objectivity of our functions as well as our ourselves. Um, what makes internal auditing, I think, so unique is the fact that it does have that independent mindset and that independent reporting to tell the board of directors the candid and unvarnished truth about what's happening within the organization. And that's really important. So who cares about these terms? And what are increased, what are stakeholders demanding um, from organizations? Or what do we see trending uh, in terms of stakeholder demands? Well, one is transparency. Um, we, we certainly are seeing transparency as a um, you know increased topic of discussion. Uh, we see laws and regulations supporting uh, transparency and disclosure, uh, and I think we're going to continue to see that trend. Um, I think the challenge that that presents to internal audit functions is to make sure that when things are are identified and deficiencies are found that we're escalating them to the right levels of the organization to make sure that remediation uh, is occurring and um, the organization is, uh, you know, when, when they have to, disclosing certain aspects of, uh, of, the, of the operations. Um, we're starting to see an increased stakeholder demand for internal audit services. Um, the IIA had put out uh, just a few years ago guidance on providing internal audit opinions. So internal audit has really become empowered and now has guidance that uh, discusses how internal audit can provide opinions around assurance um, to its stakeholders. Um, and most of the times that's going to include the, the board of directors, the governing body that has the risk oversight uh, responsibility of the organization. Professionalism um, sort of goes without saying. Uh, coordination. Um, between internal and external auditors. Um, I know I've been in positions where uh, working with uh, organizations in, uh, in their, their audit function. And when the external auditors come in, one of the decisions or determinations that they make um, regarding uh, before they rely on any type of internal audit work is, um, can we rely on the work? Is there enough independence in the auditing work and the auditing department um, for us to provide and rely on um, the, the, the the testing that's been done. Um, and stakeholders are demanding this coordination. I think we saw a little bit of, uh, after Sarbanes-Oxley in the United States, a uh, little bit of a duplicative effort where it came to what the internal auditors and the, the, the management control uh, functions were doing along with the external auditors. And uh, the difference between AS2 and AS5 uh, really, I think, clarified and helped coordinate that a little bit better. But we saw a lot of duplicate work. So on the agenda and on the forefront today is coordination, 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 making sure that the broadest coverage can be, uh, can be achieved by leveraging both the internal and external auditor's work. Um, increased responsibilities, we're certainly seeing that from an internal audit perspective. Um, you know, we have a very broad coverage of uh, and mandate to improve governance, risk, and control within our organizations. Um, this really comes down to increased responsibilities um, from, uh, from the internal audit uh, function, increased expectations uh, that stakeholders are demanding from internal audit today. Uh, and lastly, greater accountability. You know, we, uh, uh, we oftentimes uh, hear the word accountability, um, but I, I think now uh, stakeholders um, whether it be the, the, the public. So when we talk about uh, stakeholders, you know, it could be the public if it's a uh, government entity or maybe even a public corporation. Um, it could be investors. Uh, but, but external parties and these stakeholders, they want uh, management uh, accountable for the, you know, the outcomes of their decisions um, regarding the, the business. So that demand for greater accountability, I think, is another really key driver for why independence and objectivity uh, we really need to revisit these topics and uh, understand them in the context of our organizations. <clears throat> um, looking at the IIA's International Professional Practices Framework, the IPPF, um, the way independence is defined, it's defined as the freedom from conditions that threaten the ability of IA to carry out 
its responsibilities in an unbiased manner. I really like this definition because it talks about conditions that threaten. Here's what's important about the, the language here. Um, the fact that, um, and I'll use an example, um, and it might be applicable to you, maybe it's not, um, but sometimes, and, and frankly, it's, it's a little bit too common in my opinion, but you'll have a chief auditor reporting to a chief financial officer. And the idea of someone raising to the CFO that that, that reporting relationship isn't appropriate because they have the CFO has a managerial responsibility and not a governing responsibility can be a little touchy. It's a touchy subject. Um, the idea of conditions that threaten is it's a fact that if there is a condition where internal audit reports to a manager that is responsible for operations rather than a governing authority that has no managerial responsibilities that there could potentially be a threat for bias. And that's key, there's a threat for bias. It doesn't mean that the CFO is a bad guy or a bad gal, it just means that there's a, a condition that threatens that. So what does that mean? We're going to talk about the effect of, well, what does that mean and, and how can stakeholders, uh, what effect does it have on stakeholders' reliance when we see these conditions? But, but the idea of the, the word condition, I think, is important because we're not, we have to separate the, um, uh, the, uh, the problem from the people. And when you have that problem of lack of independence, it's not about not trusting the CFO or not trusting the general counsel, but it's really about the condition um, and the, 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 uh, uh, the structure that is the, the potential problem. And, and I think that's important to take away um, because if you are an audit shop that doesn't have that necessary level of independence, um, you're going to have to come up with ways to, to, to bring this topic to your, uh, to your board. Objectivity uh, is defined as an unbiased mental attitude. So when you think of objectivity, um, the IIA likes to view, the, view this as uh, the, the mental attitude um, of the internal auditor. Um, and, and the idea here and the test of that unbiased nature uh, really comes down to the internal auditor being able to believe in their work product and that no quality compromises have been made. Um, it's really important that the internal auditor does not subordinate their judgment on audit matters to others. And this can be a slippery slope. Uh, anyone that's issued a uh, audit report in draft form uh, knows that you know it's it's reasonable that it goes through a variety of uh, edits and clarifications, but sometimes um, uh, management, um, sometimes it's even very senior or executive level management, um, might push uh, really hard to um, uh, dilute um, or maybe even sometimes remove certain aspects of an audit report. Um, this is where I think the objectivity of the individual auditor drafting the report really needs to ask themselves that question is, are they subordinating their professional judgment to others? Um, and, and is it called for? Is it warranted? Is it, uh, you know, is it, is it, a, um, is it uh, reasonable that they're doing so? Sometimes we might uh, find that uh, based on a clarification, things can change. I'm not saying our audit reports are always, you know, 100% uh, uh, right and we can never change them between the draft and final form, but sometimes we really have to take into account whether or not uh, uh, we're subordinating our judgment on audit matters um, for the wrong reasons. And that's really the spirit of objectivity. Um, let's take a look at these in terms of uh, the left side is really reflecting independence. Um, a good way to remember independence is it's really talking about factual matters. Um, in my opinion, these are things that are more easily verifiable. These are things like where is the organization placed uh, within the, where is the internal audit activity placed within the organization? Um, does it report to a audit committee? Um, or is it uh, reporting to some other management function? So looking at the reporting relationships to the governing board. Um, authority to access information and people and records. Um, we'll talk about an internal audit charter. That's typically how it's empowered. Um, that's the written document that provides that authority. 
Um, and it's a fact is that document exists or, or it doesn't. Uh, on the other hand, when we talk about objectivity, we're really talking to a state of mind. Um, so this, in most cases, has to do with uh, the internal auditor's judgment, um, the bias, uh, the relationships, and the behaviors of the individual uh, internal auditor. Um, so factual matters versus a state of mind. Um, that's really, a, I think, a good way to differentiate. And uh, oftentimes people say, well, Mike, you know, can't one influence the other? And I, I would say they can. Um, you know, they're not completely mutually exclusive or they're not separate. Um, you know, it, it very well could be um, uh, challenged if a, uh, and I've seen this in smaller organizations where there's, you know, one chief auditor in the organization. They're the only auditor. They report to a CFO uh, or a general counsel. It's a factual matter. Um, independence is, you know, uh, compromised there. Um, and they're the only person. So they want to keep their job. Their state of mind could certainly be challenged as maybe being uh, biased to <clears throat> not um, report as freely as uh, internal audit is really intended to uh, Um, impairment to independence or objectivity. Uh, this is important, and this is uh, probably easier said than done. But in the situation where independence or objectivity is uh, impaired, uh, whether it's in fact or whether it's in appearance, um, the details of the impairment must be disclosed to the appropriate parties. Um, and the nature of that disclosure is going to depend upon how significant the impairment is. This is a standard set forth in the uh, IIA's International Professional Practices Framework. So if you espouse to follow that guidance and follow those uh, protocols, um, this would be the standard you'd refer to, this 1130. Um, and it specifically talks and um, there's uh, further guidance um, in practice uh, implementation uh, standards that uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail on how this can be done. But this is really the spirit of um, of the disclosure, uh, is that if there is an impairment, it needs to be disclosed. Well, why does it have to be disclosed? Well, the thing we want to be careful of is we want to make sure that we don't issue a report that somehow gets into the hands of somebody who, believe, who, who could potentially believe that there's a higher level of assurance um, that that report is providing than it actually, uh, than it actually has. Um, if I'm an external party and I'm relying on an internal audit report, I would want to know if that chief auditor is reporting directly to the board, the non-managers of the board and the board of directors uh, over the uh, CFO or CEO of the organization. I would want to know that. So it's really incumbent upon the internal auditors to make sure that the appropriate disclosures are made, um, again, if you, you choose and espouse to follow the IIA standards. Um, our first polling question uh, here, um, I'm going to ask Jim to uh, help launch this. And um, Jim, just so you know, uh, I lost my little uh, GoToWebinar uh, toolbar on the side. I know I have this issue sometimes, and uh, I'm having trouble getting it back. So uh, what I'll do in the... Uh, you probably the have, Mike, you probably have full screen enabled for your uh, presentation. Ah. And it's probably underneath that. I've launched the uh, polling question. Reminder to everyone that you must vote if you, okay, everybody has voted. That's great. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. Great. Share great. the results. Jimmy, great. Can you give me a quick summary of how those results look, Jim, since I'm uh, flying blind here? Uh, you should be seeing those. Let me just check my, yeah, as organizer and presenter, you should be seeing them on your screen. Yeah, uh, I don't have that toolbar, and I can't get it back. 
uh, you've probably pushed it off to. I clicked uh, hide the polling and I got it back. So I see that the polling question is a 50-50 mix. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, well, the best answer, um, I think, <clears throat> is B. Um, independence can be de best be described as factual matters, whereas objectivity can best be described as a state of mind. However, for the, the other 50% that said individual nature and collective in nature, um, I think there can be some truth to that, but I actually think they're reversed. I think if I had to view independence being factual matters, and, and a lot of that is talking about the internal audit activity itself, I would think that independence is probably more collective because it talks about the whole department. Whereas on the other hand, objectivity is really, uh, if we bring it down to the internal audit or judgment and behavior, it really can be viewed, I think, as an as a individual uh, uh, attribute in nature. Um, so good. So this is intended to get us thinking about this. As Jim mentioned, you have to answer these to get the uh, um, to get the CPE credit, and uh, we're not keeping track of scores anyway. Uh, but really intended to just get us keep us thinking about independence and objectivity. So good. I think we've uh, we've certainly accomplished that. Um, and I'm also asking these questions before we get into some of the uh, uh, additional guidance that I think is going to be very helpful um, to the group here. <clears throat> I want to expand a little bit upon the impairment to independence uh, and objectivity uh, from an implementation perspective. Um, again, I'm going to reference some of the guidance that you see out in the Institute of Internal Auditors IPPF. Um, there's very strict uh, rules and guidance around um, independence uh, and objectivity being impaired when an internal auditor uh, is asked to audit an area that they have audited um, in the uh, where they've worked within the past 12 months. So if you came from the inventory control department and it's your third month as an internal auditor and you're asked to, 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 to go in for an assurance engagement uh, on the in inventory control area, um, guidance would suggest that you should be presumed to have your objectivity impaired in that particular situation. Um, from a consulting perspective, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, it's very common that internal audit might uh, be engaged in a consulting assignment uh, to help improve a operational aspect of management's operation. Um, if that is the case, the level of objectivity isn't necessarily required because you're not providing assurances. Um, so in that case, it would be okay uh, per the standards. Um, however, if you did think there was something significant enough to uh, potentially impair um, the activity of the internal auditor, well, that should be disclosed. Um, so we have to really be more sensitive to when we're providing the assurance work more so than the consulting work. And if you can think back to, well, what's the fundamental difference between assurance and consulting, is remember, consulting activities typically have two parties, the audit group and management. And they determine the scope based on some mutually agreeable um, uh, process. When we talk about assurance services, we're really uh, involved in having three parties, the auditor, the auditee, and the user of the report, which is typically the board of directors. So by introducing that third party, you really have to be much more sensitive uh, to objectivity and the, and the independence uh, when you are uh, in that assurance capacity. Next, we're going to take some look at, a look at independence and factors um, impacting independence. So, one is understanding how the internal audit activity is positioned in the organization and the reports users. Okay and the recipients of direct benefits. So I mentioned that uh, who's using the report and having three parties, so to speak, during assurance engagements. Well, that's really where uh, independence uh, factors are going to play the most significant role. If the direct recipients of benefit 
are your board of directors, whom in turn, keep in mind, are often the representatives um, or the fiduciaries for a broader audience. Uh, in a public company context, uh, boards of directors have duties of loyalty and care to the organization owners. And those owners are shareholders. Right? They're the people that are investing in these companies. So the direct benefit of internal audit reports um, are really many times the, the board of directors. Um, however, you also have to keep in mind some of the other potential um, recipients of reports. It could be management, uh, regulators, external auditors, as well as customer suppliers. Um, so the types of questions and the relevance of independence um, is really um, something that has to be viewed in the context of, well, who's relying on the report? Um, again, if I'm on the board and I know that my chief audit executive is reporting up to my audit committee, um, that my audit committee is solely responsible for hiring and compensating that chief auditor uh, as an individual, as well as their, their who then in turn is responsible to uh, compensate their staff. Um, I have a lot of comfort um, that the necessary independence is there that I can put full reliance on these reports that I'm getting. That might not necessarily be the case if I'm a regulator reviewing a report uh, from a chief auditor who reports to the chief financial officer within an organization. In that particular context, I would, uh, because of that uh, lack of independence, I would actually put less reliance on the report that I'm reviewing because of the nature and structure of that of that uh, independence. Um, so uh, again, I think the, the topic of independence, you always have to keep it in context of who is the user of the report um, and who is receiving direct benefit, who are the recipients of direct benefit um, to, to uh, assess these factors. Um, so when we talk about the particular role of internal audit as an activity, well, the things we need to determine is the appropriate structure of responsibilities and the reporting level. So the reporting level, again, talking about is the chief auditor reporting to uh, the, chief, the CFO, the CEO, the general counsel, um, or is it reporting up to the board of directors? Um, and in addition to uh, reporting, Uh, also taking into account uh, compensation, which we'll get into a little bit uh, more during today's presentation. And again, all of this is going to ultimately determine the degree of reliance that should be placed on services provided. Again, I gave you two examples where if I know that independence is not free from the conditions that could affect an independent assessment of an area, I'm not going to put a high level of reliance on that. Um, Plain and simple. I'm not going to. And I think as investors, as, as stakeholders are starting to get more savvy to what internal audit can be doing, these are the types of questions that, um, that they're asking of their boards and of their management. Um, so keep that in mind. Here's the ideal scenario uh, with internal audit reporting. Uh, functionally to the governing board, administratively to management. So what does it mean to be functional versus administrative? Well, functional uh, really refers to um, uh, the governing board having responsible responsibility for uh, empowering the internal audit function, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, hiring, um, uh, modifying compensation, as well as uh, as well as terminating, if necessary, the chief auditor within a within an organization. This is a nice little uh, chart that I I like to well I think does a, a nice job of um, talking about the low level versus high level reporting. So when I'm talking about high level reporting. We're talking about uh, the governing, you know, reporting to the highest levels of the governing board. Uh, lower level reporting is, you know, your management team. So if you have to separate high and low, you have your board of directors being the highest, your managerial team being sort of the next tier, uh, and, and obviously as you go down into the management structure, the reporting getting lower and lower. 
Um, so your CEO down to your you know general counsel, CFO, um, your chief compliance officer. Sometimes I've seen directors of internal audit reporting up to uh, compliance officers. Um, the real key point here um, is when you uh, have low uh, lower level reporting, the risk increases that your engagement scope is going to have limitations. Um, so the risk of engagement scope limitation increases, uh, which goes into the red area, with low level reporting, whereas on the other hand, if your risk of engagement uh, scope limitation decreases, gets green, so to speak, uh, as you move to the spectrum of higher level reporting. And ultimately, well, what's the effect of this? What does it matter? Well, again, this comes down to the very point that a lack of a broad confidence in the assurances that IA work product provides. Um, again, uh, and maybe it's because I've been in the industry so long, but I would never put reliance on a, or I'd put a very low level of reliance on an internal audit work product knowing that that internal auditor, that chief auditor, had a reporting relationship with the uh, CFO of an organization. And I know sometimes that's typical and that's common, and you know, in some situations it's a, a stepping stone, um, I think, to um, developing a more robust and matured internal audit function. Um, but you really have to keep in mind the, the uh, correlation between scope limitation and this high and low level uh, of, of reporting. Because um, it's really significant uh, on the topics of independence and objectivity. Uh, and that brings us to polling question number two, asking the risk of scope limitation is higher when the internal audit activity has a reporting relationship that is blank. And there's two options here, high level or low level. Let's take a minute and answer this, and then we'll debrief with the answer. It looks like we have a 50-50 split. And you know, I'm reading this question and I'm thinking to myself, maybe I should have used the word increased rather than higher. And if, uh, if I did that, ask yourselves whether or not you would change your answer. Um, because the correct answer, uh, the intended answer, I should say, uh, is high level reporting. Um, high level reporting minimizes the risk that operational management will interfere with setting the scope of engagements. Um, so I'm not sure, maybe that higher word threw, uh, threw some folks off. But uh, that was the intended answer. And again, the idea here is the risk of scope limitation is increased when management is, uh, when, internal, when internal audit has a responsibility to report to management. So you say, well, why? And again, I'm talking about the risk. The reason the risk is higher is because in a situation where management um, is doing something wrong and or not wanting uh, potential deficiencies to rise above to their board of directors to make them look bad, there is the risk there that an internal auditor scope is going to be limited. So we always want to see, ideally, that reporting relationship going to the highest level, which, again, ideally would be our board of uh, directors, uh, the highest governing authority. So good. Hopefully, this is getting us to uh, keeping the wheels turning in uh, uh, in terms of independence and objectivity. Um, moving on, let's take a look at some of the activities supporting independence. Um, one is the mission statement of the internal audit function uh, and the internal audit charter. <coughs> um, Charters are the, uh, let's take a step back and remember that um, uh, our organizations uh, are nothing more than pieces of paper incorporated under some, uh, some statutory law, whether it's a state in the United States or you know, uh, laws in another country. Um, that's what a charter fundamentally is. It is the legal document that empowers the internal audit function um, to work uh, within the 
um, context of the charter for the organization. It's a legal authority, so to speak, is what the charter provides. And we'll talk about some of those key elements uh, next in, a, in an internal audit charter. Um, policy statements uh, for an internal audit function um, can certainly support independence. Um, I recall talking with uh, uh, a person who took one of my training classes, and they actually had a card. It was like a certificate signed by their board of directors uh, empowering uh, the internal audit function. Um, it was a, you know, now though a policy statement that if any manager manager uh, had had issue or question with um, providing the internal auditors any information, that they could contact um, the audit committee directly. Um, needless to say, when the internal audit function had to use that, uh, rarely did people actually bother the audit committee because uh, it was such a nice laid out, uh, you know, presentation of the the policy statement that. Um, the internal auditors would typically get uh, what they, you know, what they were asking for. Um, other documents to help promote internal audit: um, the the idea of uh, the code of ethics of an organization, uh, the audit committee charter. So similarly, um, the audit committee has certain uh, powers that are entrusted to it on behalf of the organization. Uh, many organizations have their audit committee charter available on their website. Um, I see that more so than the internal audit charters uh, being available publicly. Um, audit uh, website, uh, if your audit department has a, a website, I've always found that that's a great way to support um, uh, the awareness of internal audit, the, the independence of internal audit, the purpose of internal audit, etc. cetera. Um, and, and lastly, official you know, internal audit communications can certainly be uh, um, activities that help support independence as well. So hopefully you're using a combination of um, these things here within your own organization. Strong organizational governance. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to get the tone, the right tone from the top. I know we hear that word all the time, but it really is important, I think, if uh, you want to support independence for the internal audit function, um, that you have that top support. You want to make sure that uh, um, audit can report without restriction and without fear of retaliation or uh, for, for being uh, providing negative opinions or you know critical findings. Um, that's, that's really an important governance issue. Because without that, nothing else you do is really going to work and be effective, I think, for the internal audit function. So this is really something that a chief auditor needs to discuss with their board um, and make sure that the, the governance support is really there. Because um, that's key. Having your, your governing board um, support internal audit independence is, is essential um, to having an effective internal audit activity. So what is an internal audit charter doing? Um, so we talked about this a little bit. You know, this defines what the internal audit activity does. Um, and broadly, we look at it in terms of purpose, authority, and responsibility. It defines the reporting relationships. So it defines specifically uh, who the chief auditor would report to functionally and administratively. Um, it also should grant unrestricted access to information, people, and records. Um, I remember uh, during one of my um, <clears throat> training classes, I do some CIA certified internal auditor training classes, and one of the participants, uh, he was a, a younger green auditor, new to the profession. We were talking about the internal audit charter, and he said, Mike, that sounds to me like the backstage pass to a concert. And it made me chuckle a little bit because I thought he's really right. Um, you know, a properly structured charter, nothing should be off limits to us as uh, internal auditors. Now, this doesn't mean we have to go and ask for social security numbers of every employee unless we, that information was necessary in order to achieve the objective that uh, was approved by our board of directors. Um, but we shouldn't have um, restrictions to the information that, that we need. We should have a lot of latitude in uh, what we uh, have access to. Um, the governing board uh, body uh, <coughs> uh, oversight um, should include the responsibility to hire the CAE, evaluate and compensate the CAE, and terminate the CAE. This is so important, and I think that sometimes um, while the hiring decision is made by, by a governing body, what I see sometimes is that 
the, the compensation decisions and the reviews um, would be done by maybe the CEO or the CFO, uh, the managerial folks. And I think that's a mistake. I think when you're, you're asking the people that have, um, that, that are administratively reported to evaluate um, the internal audit group, um, you're going to introduce a potential bias and conflict there. Um, so best practice is really to make sure that that governing body uh, takes care of hiring, uh, reviewing annually, and terminating the CAE um, uh, to, to have the best uh, structure for independence. Other activities supporting uh, independence. Um, hiring and compensation practices. Uh, we hear a lot in the governance uh, talk, the governance world right now, about uh, CEO compensation and executive pay and executive compensation. Um, and these are also uh, relevant topics to talk about, well, how does this may or uh, may, may uh, impair or, or promote independence for a uh, internal audit that are serving in an internal audit capacity. You want to look for potential conflicts, um, and these could come from a variety of sources. Uh, stock ownership, um, whether or not there are family and uh, friend relationships um, within the audit department. <clears throat> um, previous work performed at the organization. Um, compensation and bonus structures. Uh, this is an important one because you want to make sure that the bonuses or the compensation is not dependent on the performance of the organizational units that are reviewed. Why would we want to do that? Well, the idea is if there's something that's tremendously wrong identified in the organizational unit that internal audit is reviewing, if internal audit knows that they're going to lose a significant bonus because of the, uh, by, by, by revealing the deficiencies in an organizational unit, then they might be not, they, they may not be so inclined to make that report. Um, so the idea is really think through, and I think compensation is important because you have to appreciate human behavior. And where there's compensation and there's money and there's human behavior and, and there's people, you know, there's going to be an element of um, tension or potential tension that's going to exist. So we really, I think, have to think through and understand how our hiring and our compensation practices uh, may or may not affect and support um, that independence of, uh, of our internal audit function and our internal audit uh, personnel. Um, and outsourcing is always an option if, in fact, uh, independence is compromised. Um, you know, uh, if a chief auditor, for example, previously worked as the um, uh, chief operations officer, well, and the chief and the operations unit is going to go under review, well, one of the things you might want to consider doing is outsourcing the audit to an independent party, um, because the chief auditor, um, again, having that managerial responsibility historically for the op operations area um, really has its independence, um, you know, uh, his or her independence compromised, um, which in turn would really reflect on the, the rest of the audit function because they're the highest person. So outsourcing could be a potential uh, solution. Uh, polling question number three, uh, to support the highest levels of independence, whom should ultimately decide to hire, compensate, and perform reviews of the CAE? Uh, take a minute and answer, and then we'll debrief with the uh, correct solution. Like we got 88 percent of the polls in. Oh, there's 100, and it looks like 
if 75% is the chair of the audit committee and 25% of uh, said CEO, and the correct answer is D, chair of the audit committee. Um, while the chief auditor might have an administrative reporting relationship with the CEO, uh, if you remember, we talked about the hiring, the compensation, and the performance reviews really being the functional, uh, part of the functional reporting, which uh, again would be best placed with the chair of the audit committee uh, to ensure the, uh, the highest levels of independence. Good. Uh, next we're going to take some a look at factors threatening objectivity. Um, we're going to first, and again, thinking these are more related to internal auditor judgment, behavior, uh, state of mind, so to speak, uh, social pressures, um, having undue influences from external parties, uh, or finding issues for arbitrary reasons. Um, you know, I've, I've sadly, uh, you know, have seen and, and, and witnessed where um, issues are found for the purpose of generating more consulting work um, for consulting firms, where the mandate coming in from uh, the external party is, you know, we need to find more issues. This is an arbitrary reason. Um, you know, you, you really uh, have to um, have a sound reason for identifying issues, and they have to be uh, helpful to the organization. They can't be arbitrary. Um, audit client influence and groupthink. Um, you know, this is important. Uh, we have to get an appreciation for audit clients' perspectives. Um, but we want to be reluctant and, and hesitant to accept and get pressured into that group think. Um, this is the way that we've always done it. Um, you know, you don't understand our business. This is just how it is. Uh, every company like ours does it this way. Um, so you have to really be cautious to uh, manage those social pressure, pressures. Uh, economic interest. Um, current or future employment opportunities. Uh, stock interest and valuation effects. So, you know, uh, I always find it interesting where organizations have um, rotation programs because one of the things I, I always encourage companies and internal audit groups to think about is you want to make sure that if you're uh, if a, a person in your department has a future employment opportunity within the operational section of the business, that economic interest that they have could potentially threaten their objectivity. So you have to be careful of those situations, and you have to make sure that um, if there it ever does rise above um, that potential, that it's getting reported and disclosed. Um, personal relationships. You know, these are the temptations to overlook or soften or delay reporting uh, reporting findings uh, to alleviate embarrassing uh, someone that you might know or, or care for. Um, you have to be careful of those. Um, I think in general, as internal auditors. We always have to be careful when we develop personal relationships in our organizations. Um, you know, we don't want to be the people that you know are are sitting at the lunch table ourselves. But at the same time, you know, we have to respect our profession and what we do, and uh, make sure that we carefully you know manage that line. Um, some other factors threatening objectivity uh, when we become too familiar with an area. Um, one, we run the risk of building uh, close personal relationships with uh, people uh, within the area under review, which could compromise our, our uh, objectivity. Um, and the other thing is we could also you know, prejudge an audit client based on past problems, which we want to avoid that as well. Um, you know, uh, I remember working in one organization, it was like, oh, the credit department, they, just, they have no ethics, they're terrible. They had all these problems a few years ago. So we want to be careful not to prejudge and carry that forward. Um, and, and not base our reviews on, on pure fact. Um, cultural, racial, and gender biases. Um, this could simply come from the geographical differences uh, or diversity in our organizations demographically. Um, we want to be careful uh, and, and uh, you know, um, be sensitive, I think, to these cultural, racial, and uh, potential gender biases, um, especially when we're operating in a global, in a global um, arena. Uh, cognitive uh, biases. You know, sometimes uh, depending on the role that we play, whether we're, we're in an audit capacity or a consulting capacity um, or a facilitator capacity, um, you know, we might find the need for 
um, you know, for consulting, well, we can't find any issues. The reality is during a consulting assignment, we might see, um, you know, something that uh, could affect a, a assurance engagement. So we want to be sensitive to um, identifying and being able to manage these uh, psychological biases uh, as well. Um, on the other hand, we might find that if just because we go in in an, in an assurance capacity that we have to find deficiencies. Um, uh, again, you want to avoid these cognitive, uh, these cognitive biases. Uh, Self-review, um, if you repeat a engagement uh, and review an area over and over and over, you know, one of the challenges is you might become reluctant to report an issue uh, because you should have caught it last year. So self-review um, is actually a factor that could threaten your objectivity. Um, intimidation and threat, uh, this could be either covert or overt in its nature um, by an audit client or another interested party um, to water down, dilute, get an internal auditor to remove certain findings on a report. You want to be careful of those uh, situations. Um, advocacy threat. Um, you really want to avoid um, uh, promoting or advocating for or against an audit client um, where to the point where your objectivity is going to become compromised. Um, I think it's important that we constantly remain very fact-based and objective in how we uh, uh, handle um, ourselves as professionals. We, wanna, we don't want to uh, be advocates for management. Um, not to say we can't bring to light significant problems and maybe solutions that they have, but we're, we're not there to advocate and represent management. Um, so be careful about uh, taking on that, that role. So how do we manage threats to objectivity? Uh, a couple of ideas here is incentives. Um, you really want to uh, have an incentive program designed to reward critical and objective thinking and penalize bias and prejudice. Um, Incentive-based pay uh, with appropriate performance measures, um, maybe some flexible work schedules, time off. I have always learned that when you're structuring your incentive-based pay and rewards, understand what each, what each individual really wants. Uh, I have found that sometimes uh, increase in pay is the most significant to some people. Uh, to other people, I have found that it's more flexibility in their time uh, or leaving uh, half days on, uh, you know, at noon on Friday uh, during the summer months. So um, really uh, designing that incentive-based pay is going to be important, I think, uh, and think about how to manage uh, uh, and promote objectivity in doing so. Uh, the use of teams, uh, bringing in that fresh perspective, uh, can reduce that threat of self-review and familiarity, uh, as well as personal relationships. Um, so that's a good piece of advice for managing threats uh, to objectivity. Uh, polling question number four. Uh, an internal auditor is told by a manager in the department she's about to audit um, uh, that he looks forward to her being a team player, quote. Is her objectivity now compromised? Take another minute and read that. Uh, I'm going to ask Jim to help launch the polling question. And just keep in mind that the polling question is uh, only going to, I think, uh, it's limited in its character, so it's going to limit that uh, first piece of the question. It looks like we got 100% of the vote in. We have 63% saying no, probably not, and 38% saying yes, probably. Um, I am going to favor the no, probably not, uh, given that we don't know what the department manager really meant by team player. I suppose on one hand it could mean helping provide sound recommendations to improve the business operation, but on the other hand it could mean that the manager does not want deficiencies getting reported up to the board. So this is, could go either way. We don't have enough information. I would suggest, however, if the auditor eventually feels intimidated 
by the manager uh, comments, then objectivity might be threatened and it should get reported up to the chief audit executive. So, to be continued, we'll have to find out how that audit goes and what he really meant by, by team player. But good, it's really getting us, uh, and I'm glad we saw a little bit of a mix there because, you know, this could imply both, you know, could be both positive and negative. These are the types of things that I think as internal auditors, when we hear this, we really have to keep in mind um, our obligation for objectivity and I think be a little um, uh, uh, cautious in uh, how management is going to act in the future. Some additional ways to manage threats to objectivity. Uh, rotation and reassignments is a good way uh, to manage these threats. Uh, training uh, to help recognize potential threats to objectivity. Um, so that avoidance or management techniques can be used. Uh, supervision. So encouraging objectivity in an auditor's work uh, is typically um, going to be found when they know an independent reviewer is going to come and scrutinize their work. So having that supervisory review um, is, is important, um, simple but important. I think most internal auditors uh, you know, generally have that practice uh, in place. Quality assessments. Um, and hiring practices. Uh, quality and insurance, uh, quality uh, assurance and improvement programs are required by IIA standards if you choose to follow them. Um, the real benefit, I think, to these types of reviews is that you can get um, an independent report uh, regarding uh, <coughs> the, the objectivity um, and the procedures in place of the department. Um, so these can be very uh, healthy, self-reflective type uh, assessments um, that can uh, really help manage a threat to objectivity. Um, and hiring practices, again, screening for these potential types of uh, conflict of interest areas. And again, outsourcing. Um, so to wrap things up, and really bring things through a, a close, I wanted to share a workflow um, w which I thought was excellent. It came from a practice guide published last, uh, uh, last fall. And it goes on to talk about how to manage threats to independence or objectivity. And they're pretty practical. So I wanted to walk through these eight steps uh, to wrap up today. And when you talk about identifying threats, that first piece, this is really whatever might cause the internal auditor to question their ability to act freely or without bias. We must identify that as a threat. And then we get into a next step of assessing the significance of that threat. So we have to ask ourselves the question, can the identified threat compromise independence or objectivity in an immediate or future circumstance? I think it's important to identify whether it's immediate or whether it's potentially a future circumstance because that helps us prioritize that significance of the threat. Third, we have to ask, are there relevant mitigating factors that alleviate the threat to independence or objectivity? And if there's not relevant mitigating factors, then we have to consider step five. But first, identifying those mitigating factors, we have to then ask, do the mitigating factors sufficiently mitigate the threats to allow the internal auditor to perform their work so the risk of ineffective audits is minimized? Note, though, that the internal auditor should make this assessment from the perspective of a person relying on their judgment. When necessary, escalate for review or independent assessment. So keep in mind, when you're m making these decisions, you have to think about it in terms of if someone was asking this question, how would they view your decision? Number five, proactively manage residual threat. Threats to independence or objectivity that are not sufficiently offset by mitigating factors should be appropriately managed by auditors to ensure audits can be performed without interference or bias. So what tools can we use to do this? Well, we've talked about some of them. A strong internal audit charter, um, third-party reviews, or maybe even outsourcing and contracting the work to another party. 
Uh, bringing in an external party could be a, a solution. Uh, number six, assess presence of unresolved threats. If unmitigated or unmanaged threats to independence or objectivity remain, assess whether it is still possible or practical to perform the work. And a note here is that it might be advisable to inform users of services about the unresolved threats prior to the beginning of the audit work. This is where that disclosure standard, I think, really is applicable, is you have to make sure that these unresolved threats are disclosed to the users of the report, that the users of the report are aware of these potential um, threats to independence or objectivity. Uh, seven, determine reporting and disclosure implications. Uh, ensure steps taken to manage threats to independence or objectivity are adequately documented to provide an accurate record of the auditor's efforts to achieve independence or objectivity. It's important that we document our thought process in this step so that the outcome and the, and the solution that we, we, we bring um, is thoroughly documented and can be reviewed by uh, a third party. And, and again, the idea is you would hope that they would land at the same conclusion that you did. Uh, and lastly, um, review and monitoring. Uh, chief audit executive should review and monitor to ensure compliance with independence and objectivity at the engagement and overall process level. <laughs> the Quality Assurance and Improvement Program assessors review compliance with independence and objectivity standards. That, again, is in the context of uh, if you choose to follow the uh, internal audit uh, IPPF standards, uh, part of the quality assurance review that's required every five years from an external party is an excellent opportunity uh, to support this review and monitoring uh, process. Um, I know we're just about out of time here, so I want to thank everyone uh, for your time this afternoon. Uh, Jim has some closing remarks, so Jim, why don't I pass things back to you, and uh, again, thank you everyone for your time and attention. Thanks, Mike, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to share them. Uh, I don't see uh, I don't see many questions. I don't see any questions actually that have come in. So if you do have any questions, please send them uh, to either Mike or myself, and we'll do our best to answer them. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and again to thank Mike for uh, a great presentation on auditor independence, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that the purpose of our training without travel webinars is to provide you with high-quality, low-cost online alternative training solutions covering timely topics with value-added resources and tools that you can use in your job. We bring the world's best subject matter experts directly to your desktop with timely information. Our next webinar, which should be on uh, uh, the final slide in today, and we do have a special offer for that, Ethical Dilemmas and Internal Auditing will be next uh, uh, next Tuesday, April 9th at 1 o'clock. So if you haven't already signed up for that, uh, please, please do. And we are offering a special rate for an entire audit department to sign up for these webinars, and everybody on staff can receive CPE. Just a reminder, we are recording this webinar, and the recording will be made available to you uh, within five to seven business days, and you will also be receiving your CPE certificate as long as you completed all of the, uh, the polling questions. So again, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Mike, for putting on uh, this uh, excellent presentation. And we look forward to uh, seeing you again next Tuesday. Thanks.